So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Rich Shilsky. I'm a medical oncologist. I'm the chief medical officer at the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Uh, prior to joining ASCO about uh, 18 months ago, uh, I was on the faculty at the University of Chicago for nearly 30 years in a variety of different roles there. Uh, I want to take you back to the battlefields of Europe during the First and Second World Wars. Uh, when mustard gas was used by the combatants um, in, in, uh, on the battlefield. Mustard gas is a highly volatile, toxic, yellow cloud. If you inhale it, it will burn your lungs out. Uh, you will die from acute pulmonary hemorrhage. If it touches your skin, it'll melt the skin off your arm. Um, and it can cause instant blindness by destroying the corneas of your eyes. Um, it is not a, a good death. Um, but if you survive mustard gas, um, and some, some of the soldiers did, um, uh, it was, it was uh, then discovered sometime later, um, months later, um, that many of these soldiers uh, now had a new medical problem. They had uh, anemia. They had low white blood cell counts. They had hemorrhage because they had no platelets in their blood. Um, and when they were evaluated by their physicians, it was discovered that they now had a new problem of bone marrow aplasia. The bone marrow had been wiped out by the exposure to mustard gas. <clears throat> so this actually um, <clears throat> led people to think about whether uh, derivatives of mustard gas might actually be used in the treatment of rapidly growing blood cancers like leukemia and lymphoma. Um, and it led in 1947 to two pharmacologists at Yale University, uh, Lewis Goodman and Alfred Gilman, getting a contract from the federal government uh, to study a derivative of mustard gas called nitrogen mustard. Um, nitrogen mustard is a kind of a drug called an alkylating agent. It was the first alkylating agent that was brought into clinical development. And Goodman and Gilman gave nitrogen mustard to mice with leukemia, <clears throat> and in fact, they found that it eradicated the leukemia and the mice were cured. Um, and then they tested nitrogen mustard in normal mice and normal dogs and discovered um, what its side effect profile was and what dose might possibly be administered safely to a person. <clears throat> and they prevailed on a colleague of theirs at Yale who was treating um, a, young, a young man <clears throat> with an advanced lymphoma um, uh, who had no other treatment options, they prevailed on their colleague to give this patient a trial of an infusion of nitrogen mustard. <clears throat> and remarkably, the patient's swollen lymph nodes disappeared, the patient's abnormal blood counts returned to normal, <clears throat> and the patient entered a remission. It was the first demonstration uh, that chemotherapy, treatment with drugs, could actually be effective in treating a patient with advanced cancer. Unfortunately, <clears throat> that patient's remission was not long-lived and the cancer ultimately came back and the patient died. But <clears throat> that observation opened up the field of chemotherapy treatment for cancer. Along with work that was going on around the same time, <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, uh, in, you know, again in the um, uh, 1950s um, by Sidney Farber um, uh, at Boston Children's Hospital. Farber was a hematologist and a hematopathologist, and he had made the observation uh, looking at the bone marrows of children with acute uh, lymphoblastic leukemia, uh, that the bone marrows resembled um, a condition that he had seen in adults, uh, a condition related to deficiency in the vitamin folic acid, um, known medically as megaloblastic anemia. So he thought, well, maybe leukemia in children is due to folic acid deficiency, and he treated children uh, with large doses of folic acid, and their leukemias grew like wildfire. Uh, and the leukemias just took off, and the children rapidly perished. Um, but it led him to think about whether or not if the cancers are stimulated to grow by folic acid, maybe they could be inhibited uh, in their growth by using an antagonist of folic acid, an antifolate. That led to the development of another new class uh, of cancer chemotherapy drugs, the antifolates, the first of which was amethopterin, the second of which was um, uh, aminopterin or methotrexate. 
Methotrexate is still in use today and you know, one of the mainstays for treatment of childhood acute leukemia. So these two clinical observations really made by pioneering physicians um, uh, kindled the development of the whole field of cytotoxic chemotherapy for cancer. And they came out of this observation made on the battlefield. Um, since that time, in the ensuing you know, 30 or 40 years, there have been dozens uh, of chemotherapy drugs developed uh, for treating cancer um, using the same basic paradigm uh, of find a chemical, see if it kills cancer cells in the laboratory, test it in animals, find a dose that might be safe to give to human beings, and then start clinical trials by giving patients with advanced cancer doses of the drug to determine the highest possible dose that a patient could tolerate uh, without developing life-threatening or irreversible side effects, and then use that dose of the chemotherapy um, to study um, additional patients with far advanced cancer, trying by empirical observation uh, to figure out uh, whether or not the drug is effective and in what cancer types. Um, and this whole uh, paradigm of uh, empirical chemotherapy drug development um, was the, was the, the primary uh, paradigm for drug development for about half a century, um, leading to, you know, as I said, the development of many useful and effective chemotherapy drugs, the majority of which, though, were not well understood with respect to their mechanism of action or their pharmacology and were not at all selective. So chemotherapy, whoops. Don't change the slides for me and then ask me to change them. Uh, <clears throat> so chemotherapy uh, in its early forms, you know, is the flamethrower approach to treatment. Uh, Andrine just mentioned her experience getting uh, high-dose chemotherapy and autologous bone marrow transplant and how it essentially burned out her insides. Um, well, that's the experience of, uh, of uh, cytotoxic chemotherapy. It's a little like trying to remove a few dandelions from your lawn by burning up the entire lawn and then hoping that just the good grass grows back. Um, so, um, uh, so chemotherapy, um, you know, is, is far from the perfect treatment for cancer. Um, and we have the advantage now based on uh, the next generation uh, in cancer biology, cancer genomics, <clears throat> of really sharpening the focus uh, of cancer treatment, <clears throat> so that we're now beginning to develop and use treatments that really can pinpoint specific molecular abnormalities in cancer uh, and develop very specific uh, blocks uh, to those molecular abnormalities, um, some of which are unique in cancer cells and therefore uh, allowing us to develop treatments that are highly specific, highly effective, and minimally toxic, and I'll come back to that point in a minute. <clears throat> All right. So now I need you to change the slide. <laughs> All right. Um, so, um, but going back to the impact of cancer chemotherapy, <clears throat> although that's a treatment that um, you know many people decry as being excessively toxic and minimally effective, I think we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that many patients have benefited uh, now over the last 50 years. Uh, from the development of cancer chemotherapy. A patient diagnosed with cancer um, in the mid-1970s had less than a 50-50 chance of surviving five years after that cancer diagnosis. A patient diagnosed with cancer today has better than a two-thirds chance uh, of being alive five years after that diagnosis, and many are cured. Um, much of this progress, not all of it, certainly, uh, much of this progress um, has been the result of the development of effective chemotherapy treatments for various kinds of cancer. Chemotherapy remains the mainstay of treatment for virtually all childhood types of cancer, the majority of which are curable with chemotherapy. Chemotherapy remains um, the mainstay of treatment uh, in the adjuvant setting, so after treatment of the primary tumor uh, for breast cancer, for colorectal cancer, for non-small cell lung cancer, for many other kinds of cancers, where chemotherapy um, extends the survival and improves the probability of cure for many patients. Uh, and chemotherapy delivered together with radiation is a highly effective treatment for many locally advanced cancers like head and neck cancer or locally, uh, locally advanced uh, lung cancer. <clears throat> 
So we're not quite ready to discard chemotherapy yet, um, <clears throat> although I think many of us would like ultimately to replace chemotherapy uh, with um, the next generation of highly targeted treatments. Those treatments are coming from the genomic revolution, from our understanding that cancer is largely a genetic disease. This understanding began to emerge um, uh, probably uh, in, in the uh, late 1960s with a demonstration by Peter Knoll and Janet Rowley and others of recurring chromosomal translocations in certain kinds of leukemia and the recognition that these were not uh, uh, events that were caused by the leukemia, but they in themselves were causative of the leukemia. Um, and then with the discovery in the 1980s by Bishop and Varmus of oncogenes, the field really exploded and we, became to, we came to recognize that cancer is a disease of genetic abnormalities driven by um, excessively activated metabolic pathways um, that are due either to turned on oncogenes, like stepping on the gas pedal in your car, uh, or turned off tumor suppressor genes, like having a brake failure in your car. But either way, your car is accelerating out of control, uh, growing too fast, uh, and in the case of cancer, uh, acquiring the capability of spreading throughout the body. Um, and it's this understanding of the genetic basis of cancer and the fact that cancer is a remarkably heterogeneous disease. Um, uh, each cancer in each person is probably unique uh, in its genomic profile. Um, within a, a, an individual, each spot of cancer is probably in some ways unique. Uh, and cancer is not static. Cancer changes over time. Cancer evolves in the patient in response to treatment and the cancer that a patient dies from is not the same as the cancer that a patient is diagnosed with. But these insights into the genetic basis of cancer, of course, have uh, enabled us now to develop the new generation of, of precisely targeted um, biomarker-driven um, therapies for cancer, many of which are uh, pills, so cancer treatment is transitioning from largely infusion-based treatments given in the doctor's office to pills that are written for by a prescription and picked up at your local pharmacy. Still require very careful management and oversight by the oncologist, but it's a different treatment uh, paradigm now for many patients. And these treatments, of course, are uh, uh, very highly effective. Diseases that have formerly been completely uh, recalcitrant uh, in their treatment, like advanced melanoma, advanced lung cancer, um, and kidney cancer, uh, are now routinely responding um, to uh, these targeted therapies, albeit um, for far shorter periods of time than we would like, because there still is the problem of emerging drug resistance. Now, <clears throat> what's been the implication of all this? Um, so. Um, you know, every time we make progress in cancer, uh, we uh, encounter more and more challenges and, and more and more obstacles. Uh, on the research side, particularly on the clinical research side, the development of this, these new targeted agents is more complicated than ever before because it requires not only applying the same basic principles of drug development, understanding the pharmacology, getting the dose right, getting the schedule right, uh, and things of that sort. but to optimize the use of many of the targeted agents, we now also need some sort of test that can identify which patient has the target active in their tumor and therefore which patient is most likely to benefit from that particular treatment. So we're no longer talking about developing just drugs. We're talking about developing drugs together with diagnostic tests. Uh, and that invokes a much more complicated research infrastructure, a much more complicated uh, regulatory um, uh, uh, scenario uh, and uh, drives up the cost uh, of, of doing uh, much of this type of clinical research. Um, cancer treatment um, is likewise increasingly complicated for doctors because the, in a sense there's almost too much information out there. We recognize um, that uh, each patient is unique, that uh, there are many of these genomic tests that are now being offered uh, and provided to patients. Um, and it's possible with, you know, current technologies to interrogate not just one gene or a handful of genes, but hundreds or sometimes thousands of genes uh, in one laboratory test. Um, 
how the doctor who receives those reports ultimately interprets that information um, and, and can make sense of it and apply it in developing an optimal treatment plan for a patient is a huge challenge, as most oncologists simply don't have the training uh, to be able to um, uh, you know, integrate all that knowledge and use it to select the, be the best possible treatment. Of course, the costs of treatment are also rising dramatically, in part due to the extensive infrastructure and regulatory um, uh, scenarios required to develop these new drugs and tests, with the result that recently introduced cancer drugs are costing upwards of $10,000 a month. If we have to use them in combination, which many of us predict we will, we're talking about giving two or three drug combinations. Can we really afford? Uh, can patients afford? Can our healthcare system afford? Can our society afford to spend $30,000 a month to give a patient a triple drug combination, um, which is likely to be the future of cancer treatment. Um, cancer care delivery is also more complicated than ever before because cancer treatment is inherently a multidisciplinary activity. Almost from its inceptions, we've, you know, we've had medical oncologists, surgical oncologists, radiation oncologists, pathologists, radiologists, all working together to formulate the optimal treatment plan for a patient. Now, though, we have to bring in our colleagues in interventional radiology because we need the people who can get the, the tissue specimens to do the genomic profiling. And we have to bring in uh, the molecular pathologists who do that type of molecular profiling and help us to interpret it. Um, and whether or not uh, you know, an oncologist can access all these services, particularly the molecular expertise in their local communities, uh, of course, is, is problematic uh, in, in many settings. Um, so um, all of these things are conspiring to drive up the costs of care, uh, increase the fragmentation of healthcare delivery, uh, make it more complicated uh, for the patient to access the treatment that is likely to benefit them at the time that they need it, and make it more difficult for the uh, for the doctor uh, to put together the healthcare team that he or she needs to optimize treatment for the patient. It's more complicated for payers to figure out what they should pay for and when they should pay for it, um, and. Uh, of course, the, the, the costs are placing enormous stresses on our healthcare system and our society. Uh, I'm confident, though, and I'm sure the following speakers uh, will help to provide us some solutions to these problems. One of the things we've always achieved in cancer treatment from its very beginning is to um, figure out uh, if a treatment is effective, how to make it available accessible and tolerable for patients. And you know, I'm certainly confident that uh, we'll be able to accomplish that uh, with the next generation of cancer treatments as well. Thanks.